and jet lag is a bit difficult to get over. I want to place on record some introductory comments. Um, I believe that the record of freedom of expression and the threats to the media, particularly post-war, bear no recollection or retelling. They are on record on almost every single media freedom index that has been released in the world. We are at the bottom. It is not a particularly, uh, it is not a record that we can be particularly proud of. I also happen to take a sneak peek at Thistle's comments, and I think he will be going more into the details of the ignoble record that exists in the country today. I want to present to you some aspects that in the larger narrative, in the larger story, sometimes are conveniently forgotten or marginalized. I want to begin by recalling a statement by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights released in New York yesterday. And I quote, it's a larger statement, at least three government ministers have joined in an extraordinary array of distortion and abuse during our visit. And the quote goes on to suggest that, I quote, a coordinated campaign of disinformation in an attempt to discredit the High Commissioner or to distract from the core messages of our visit. For those who are familiar with the visit of Namibille to the country would know that she faced an amazing pushback from the highest levels of government. The statement is extraordinary because it is the UN in its official capacity, and if you read the statement, basically saying that the brother of the president, the defense secretary, Gautabe Rajapaksa, is a liar. It is an explicit statement, and there has not been a response from the government today. <coughs> Persons to Ms. Pillay's visit, journalists who met with her in particular, from even the BBC, suffered interrogation at the hands of the police and military intelligence. We know that in the lead up to the elections, the counting is ongoing at the moment as we speak. There have been reports again from the BBC, a number of journalists who have been reporting on their activities leading up to the election and on election day itself of threats, intimidation, being followed by the military, and those they spoke to subsequently being interrogated by the police and intelligence authorities as well. This gives you a hint of the larger picture that the country finds itself in. And as I said, it bears no retelling. It's a very, very disturbing situation. One obvious result of this is that the government would suggest, and quite honestly may I add, that there is no official censorship. But the culture of anxiety and fear, unfortunately, have led to an extremely high degree of self-censorship. People are genuinely scared, worried, not just for themselves, but their families, their colleagues, and their institutions about articulating that which may cross an invisible line, but once crossed, results in very violent pushback. We don't know where the line is. We don't know who the attack is going to come from. We don't know when it is going to come from. But it's a very definite line that you don't want to cross. There are, as has been hinted by earlier speakers, some, some avenues of hope. What we have found in Sri Lanka, and partly also because I set up a citizen journalism initiative in 2006, is that in recent years, the mobile web and the internet have changed the game in how information is produced, disseminated, archived, and transmitted, both within the country, but also from outside within. Uh, to, 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 uh, to consumers in the country as well. What's happening is something that is not entirely acknowledged. It's almost inconvenient to acknowledge. On the one hand, we have a government that is as illiberal as you can get. However, there is also unprofessionalism in the media itself. I'll talk about that later. What's happening with regards to censorship is something quite interesting. It is not so much the Lasanta Vikramatunga method of censorship. It is not censorship by outright murder. It is now censorship by buying out media institutions that are inconvenient. So a very simple method, and a tried and tested recipe, is that you have a businessman or woman, a business person, who is a proxy of government, who literally goes and buys out the institution. And with that buyout comes control. And the editorial line of the institution, whether it is print or broadcast, is very definitely 
than a set agenda. What you have as a countervailing force is a blossoming of web media, not just in English, also in Sinhala and Tamil, not just within the country, but from the diaspora as well, with a large number of consumers in the country. I'm going to go into the debate that is a quite a tired one of how much people beat the web and the internet in the country. The fact is that to bear witness to the liberalism, the human rights violations, and what is actually happening on the ground in the country, today, the media that you would turn to is not necessarily the mainstream print or broadcast for a variety of reasons, but the online, the blog, the Facebook groups, the Twitter accounts. Uh, and this has, in a sense, changed the way in which incidents like, for example, Valley a very recent uh, riot in which, interestingly, uh, civilians uh, in the South were targeted and killed by the army was reported. And so it's, it's in, a in a sense, changing the dynamics of how things that are inconvenient in the government are being reported. There are elements of concern. It is not as if the government is entirely unaware of this. A couple of months ago, there was a, a, a move to introduce ethics and legislation on media ethics. These ethics, by the way, are public. It's a public document. It has the most bizarre language that you can think of. There were two clauses, amongst many others. One clause, I think it was point number three, suggested that anything against, and I quote, the public interest would not be tolerated or countenanced. I have no idea what that means. And perhaps it is that very thing that actually gives rise to the fear that it could have been abused. There was another clause. That, and I've, I, it's so convoluted that I have trouble recalling it, but it had words to the effect that anything that affected Sri Lanka's standing in its foreign policy was also not to be countenanced. So if you publish something that led to, for example, India criticizing Sri Lanka, then you could be held accountable for that. Now, I, I'm not making this up. This was literally a government document table for serious consideration until the president said, for whatever reason, that the media itself should look into it and he tabled it. It isn't, it isn't one that is rescinded. It isn't one that is forgotten. It's just in cold storage. It's like a Democlean sword that can be recalled and re-energized at any time. I want to spend some time speaking about the web and social media because there's something very disturbing happening. You would think that based on what I said, that there is something positive as well. And yes, it is positive. But there's another aspect to this. Ground News, for those of you who know, is a website that does not publish anything, any article, or any comment without somebody going through it. Very often, since its inception in 2006, that person has been me. I have read upwards of 40,000 comments, which, if you take at an average of about, of around 150 words, runs into millions of words. I've literally read every single word before it goes up over seven years. What's happening is that on Facebook and social media, in Sinhala, there is a growing radicalization. The level of hate against the Muslims on social media like Facebook in Sinhala is greater today than the venom against the Tamils at the height of the war. Secondly, there is also a radicalization at a very young age. Those who are participating are around 18 years of age, and they come from leading schools in Colombo. So you wonder what kind of society and polity with this radicalization in the generations ahead Sri Lanka is creating, because there's also no role models, there's also no course correction by the mainstream media itself. Finally, I think, in terms of self-criticism, in opposing government, both the mainstream media and civil society writ large have failed to provide alternatives that have greater public traction. And that's very sad, because we seem to be hostages to a lack of creative thinking. Yes, there is an extremely dire situation with regards to freedom of expression in Sri Lanka, 
But that does not mean that you can use avenues that are available to you that weren't available a couple of years ago to express dissent in ways that you can do. And not just using words, but using video, photography, audio, infographics, etc. These are some of the things that I have tried to champion as open examples, as templates that others can also do. I end by saying that and imploring you that, as was suggested earlier, Sri Lanka only seems to come to the limelight when there's an international conference or something on those lines. The story of the repression of media in Sri Lanka is a very complex one. Mainstream media has a role to play in it. The government is censorious, and there doesn't seem to be a light at the end of the tunnel. And I hope that in the discussions that follow, we can flesh out some of these issues and eschew the simplistic approach to <coughs> understanding the country's media landscape that often prevails in forums such as this. <laughs>